I just want to pray for a second to kind of, uh, just before I start this message, let's just pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your presence in this place. And Father, I ask that during this time that you would visit in a mighty way, Lord. I ask that you would anoint our eyes, anoint our ears. Lord, give us eyes to see and ears to hear. And I pray, Father, that you would release a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of the truth, in the knowledge of your word. We ask you to do that, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, I'm going to share a message today that's called the flaming sword. The flaming sword. Ooh, yeah, what is that? <laughs> anyway, praise God. So let's start uh, by, if you have your Bibles with you, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And I'm sure she'll have it on the overhead if you don't. And um, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14 says this. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. Okay, I just want to expound on that slightly. I want to talk about some spiritual things today, and, uh, which is good. That's what we ought to be talking about is spiritual things. If, if Jesus were here in the flesh, that's what he would be doing. He'd be talking about spiritual things because that's what he did when he taught. Uh, this scripture says, The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they, the things of the Spirit of God, are foolishness unto him. You might say this, the unsaved, the unborn again person cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. And that would be true. Unsaved people can't receive the things of the Spirit of God. But there's still a lot of the natural man in every one of us. I don't care how long we've been in this thing. The, ma the natural man is still in there. He may be pushed down to the point that you're, you're walking free from him, but he's still in there. And this natural man, this old man, the Bible calls him the old man, this carnal man, God deals with him over time. You know, over the years, God deals with that carnal man within us. You know, we, we, we get the victory over that oh, as the years go by. So we learn to stop thinking with the carnal man and we start thinking with the spirit man, our born-again human spirit. It's our, it's our spirit that's born again, not our, you know... When I was born again, I didn't suddenly be a different human being on the outside, a different physical person. It was my spirit that was changed. And so that's what we're talking about, the spirit man. And he goes on to say, neither can he, the, the natural man, know them. He cannot know and understand them because they're spiritually discerned. And that's what I want to talk about, spiritually discerning things. Uh, and it's not something we don't know anything about. Um, hopefully a lot, a lot of folks are spiritually discerning a lot of things, but we want to talk about it and focus on it. Um, you remember the story about the road to Emmaus, the two disciples that Jesus met? And they met him and he talked with them and then he disappeared out of their sight and they said, did not our hearts burn within us as he opened to us the scriptures? Didn't our hearts burn? Didn't something go on in the inside of us when he was revealing the scriptures to us? And there's a hunger in every human being for the revealed word of God. We're created to feed on the word of God. Whether you're saved or unsaved, you may not know you have that hunger, but it's in there. And you're normally trying to satisfy it with other things until you meet God, get born again, and begin to feed on the word of God. So... Um, the Word of God must be spiritually discerned. If we try to understand it with our natural thinking, we come up with all sorts of things that are not really in line with God's truth. That's why you have so many weird doctrines out there in the church. Uh, how many enjoyed Samantha's message last week? Anybody like it? Praise God. Hallelujah. I thought it was all right. No, I'm kidding. It was really good. It was really good. Anyway, you remember she talked about the hyssop and the two birds? used for healing. One of them was sacrificed and the other was dipped in the blood and released to fly away. And uh, this passage in, in Leviticus is pretty boring. If you're trying to, you can't sleep at night, just go read some of that, you know, and you, you just 
nod right off. But until you spiritually discern it, until you see that it pictures something like the freedom and the blessing we have in Christ by the blood of Jesus, so and so on and so forth, we fly free. You know, she brought out some analogies there which were really good, and they, they feed you when you get that. She shared a lot of insights. And see, the spiritually discerning the Word is done largely by spending time in the Word and meditating in it. Now, you can listen to somebody preach the revelation God's given them, and you can receive the Word that way. You can receive revelation that way, but it's largely done in part by reading this Word. Samantha described it as I was just, I was just looking at the Scripture, and I just couldn't get off of it. I just couldn't get off of it, and the Lord just kept me there, and then he showed me this, and he showed me that, and I just couldn't get off of it, off of an otherwise boring scripture. See, that's how you, that's spiritually discerning. The Lord speaks things to you, and um, so I'm not talking now about spiritualizing. Does anybody know the difference between spiritual discerning and spiritualizing? When you spiritualize, you get some spiritual lies. The Lord just gave me that. Praise God. <laughs> I've never heard anybody say that before. The Lord just said, when you spiritualize, you get spiritual lies. And I've heard a lot of it over the years. People take a scripture and say, well, the Lord, this means this and it means that. I'm thinking my, my head's starting to hurt. Oh, what are you talking about? You know, it doesn't bear witness with your spirit. When something is truth, it bears witness with your spirit. By spiritualizing, that's not what I'm talking about. You can't, maybe you spiritualize until you figure out how to spiritually discern. Fake it till you make it. You have to start somewhere. One of the best examples of spiritually discerning the Word of God is found in Galatians chapter 4. And I just, I've never heard anybody share on this. I want to just mention it. Where the Apostle Paul tells us that Hagar and Sarah represent the two covenants. Really? Let's take a look at Galatians chapter 4, verse 21. You remember Paul is trying to get these Galatians to not go back to keeping the law of Moses. They were bent on going back to keeping the law. He said, no, 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 no. Who has bewitched you that you should do this? He said in chapter 4, verse 21, Tell me, you that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? So he's going to tell us something that's revealed in the law right now. Do you not hear it? Verse 22, For it's written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, Hagar, the other by a free woman, his wife Sarah. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. But he uh, of the free woman was born by promise. New Covenant people, by the way, as you know, are born of the Spirit. They're born from above. They're born by the promise. Galatians 4, 24 says, Which things are an allegory? An allegory. What's an allegory? It's a figure. It means allegorically speaking, figuratively speaking. These are the two covenants. The one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to, or fathers, or creates bondage. This covenant that was from Mount Sinai fathers or creates bondage, which is Agar or Hagar. Verse 25, for this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answers to, and answers to or represents Jerusalem, which now is the present natural Jerusalem. I hope I hadn't lost you at this point here because it's, it's some, and is it is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Paul says that Hagar represents Mount Sinai, where the old covenant was given to Moses. And Sarah represents the new Jerusalem, or the new covenant, which is from above. That's what he just said. And in verse 28, he says, Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. So Isaac represents the children of promise, promise which speaks of us, the New Testament church. Samantha said last week that the bird that flew away represented us. And, and that my spirit bore witness with that. How does a bird represent us? Well, 
when the Spirit quickens it to you, you see it. You see a spiritual truth. Verse 29, ah, but as then he that was born after the flesh, that was Ishmael, persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. Remember, Sarah saw Ishmael mocking her son Isaac. Do you remember that in the scripture? And she was angry about it. And it goes on in verse 30. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. That's what she told Abraham. Cast out this bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. Verse 31. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. See, they wanted to go back to the law which, and become children of the bondwoman. Now, he's saying that those under the old covenant, the law, were in bondage, but those under the new covenant are free as the free woman, as of the free woman. Now, okay, I just shared what's right there written in the Bible. I didn't make any of that up. I just read what he said, what Paul the Apostle says. But that would be a stretch for me to read that, those scriptures in Abraham's life and then say, well, this... Hagar represents the Old Covenant, and Sarah represents the New Covenant, and Isaac represents the child of promise, which we are. I would have not been able to stretch that far. But how many believe Paul was rightly discerning the word of truth? I believe he was. Hallelujah. Then maybe we can take some liberty to interpret things that way. Not end up spiritualizing, but spiritually discerning what the Scripture is saying to us. And so I want to talk about some things that may be a little on the spiritual side today. So put on your spiritual hat. All right? Praise God. Put on your hearing ears. Hallelujah. You know, and we'll watch for the witness of the Spirit. If it's dead, then there won't be any witness of the Spirit. But if it's truth in it, something will say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Didn't our hearts burn when the Word was opened to us? Amen. So this is called the flaming sword. And... I just want to share So It started in Genesis here, this flaming sword. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 22, we remember that, that Adam and Eve had sinned against the Lord. And now it says in verse 22, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is, has become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever, just kind of left that open-ended. You may recall Satan had enticed Eve by telling her that if she ate this forbidden fruit, that she would be like a god to know good and evil. And the Lord says here in verse 22 that indeed the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. Now obviously God had knowledge of good and evil, but it was not something that man was supposed to have. As long as Adam stayed away from that fruit, he remained safely in the garden. And by the way, the word Eden means uh, pleasure. He was in the garden of pleasure. And in other places in the Bible, it's interpreted as paradise. In the paradise of God. So when you hear that word paradise, you're talking about Eden, really. Because the word Eden meant pleasure, and it's referred to as paradise. Adam lived in paradise. He ate of every tree of the garden, including the tree of life. The one fruit he was not supposed to eat was the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You remember that? Now, these are spiritual trees we're talking about. How many know that? Have you ever stopped to think about that? Were these actual literal trees or were they spiritual trees? Okay. Okay. It's getting nice and quiet. I like that. That means you're listening. Praise God. These are spiritual trees. The forbidden fruit that Adam ate was in reality the knowledge of his own disobedience. The inner knowledge that he had sinned against God. That was the fruit that came into him when he ate of that fruit. Now, I may have, I'm not saying it wasn't physical. It could have been physical, you know. But the, the deal, the spiritual part of it was that he disobeyed God when he ate it. He sinned against God when he ate it. And the spiritual element of it was that now he had in him the consciousness that he had sinned against God. 
He had knowledge of sin in his life. And that was a condition that could not remain in paradise. But it drove man away from God, and it still does that today. Sin still separates a person from God every single time. And uh, praise God. It says, Now lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. It's saying if the man had eaten of the tree of life in that condition, that he would have stayed in that condition forever. That's kind of the implication, although it doesn't say it exactly. It says that he would stay that way forever. Now, verse 23, Therefore the Lord sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. Again, we're talking about spiritual things. The Garden of Eden was and still is a spiritual place, a place that's not of this world. Even in that day, it was a spiritual condition that had to do with the presence of God. Yes, Adam was in the natural physical world. But the place called Eden was and still is a spiritual place. See, Adam had walked side by side with God in the cool of the day. But now fellowship with God was broken. Adam was alienated from God. He was without God in the world. And that's the condition that was passed down to the generations of men after him. That condition of being separated from God, without God in the world. It's the same condition each of us were in before we received Christ. The Bible says that we were alienated from the covenants of promise, promise and without God in the world, just like Adam was. And it also says that while we were yet sinners, thank God, Christ died for the ungodly. You see, God made a way back into fellowship with him. How did he do that? By delivering us from our sins. That was Adam's problem. He had the knowledge of good and evil. He had the knowledge of his own sin within him, and he couldn't be delivered from it without a Savior. So he was driven from the presence of God until that Savior could come and deliver. So... It was by delivering us from our sins that we now... Do, we, do you, anybody here have fellowship with God? Praise God. Every one of us have fellowship with God. We didn't have it before because the blood of Jesus. Now, Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. So God drove out the man, and he placed him at the east of the Garden of Eden. He placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims, or angels, angelic beings... And a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Why did God put angelic guards there? To keep man from getting to the tree of life. Man had, was kept from the tree of life while he was in that condition. Cherubim, you know, are angelic creatures. They're angelic guards in this case. Now, if Eden was a spiritual place, and it was, it is, then it would need to be guarded by spiritual forces or angelic beings. It says he placed there a flaming sword which turned every way. The word flaming here, if you look it up in the concordance, it means flaming. As of angelic beings. I think that's, I got that pretty close. As of angelic fire. So even the, the flames that he's talking about here, this flaming sword, are angelic, spiritual. The weight of the garden was guarded by an angelic sword or a flaming sword. Now, I like this phrase, turned, which turned every way. The flaming sword turned every way. It means, now if you go to the concordance, I like to look up words because you, you hear things when you look up words. It means to turn it means to turn about. It means to change. It means to transform. To turn, to turn about, to change, to transform. The thing that guards the way to God's paradise is a flaming sword that transforms. And if we're spiritually discerning right now, I think we'll recognize that he's talking about the Word of God. 
This is the flaming sword that transforms. And we'll talk more about that, but I just wanted to throw that out there. Because to me, I don't have any problem seeing that. I can spiritually discern that. This flaming sword is a spiritual sword that transforms. Um, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. We're all familiar with these scriptures. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How is the mind transformed and renewed? I'm giving you all a chance to answer. Come on, help me out here. By the word of God. That's how, that's how the mind is renewed. It's the renewing by the word of God. <clears throat> By receiving the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. That word save means to renovate, <clears throat> to change. How? By the engrafted word, it's able to save our soul. I thought our souls were already saved. Uh-oh. Well, our spirit's born again. Our spirit's saved, but our soul needs work, our soul needs work on it once we get, we get born again. Paul refers to the Word of God in Ephesians chapter 6 as the sword of the Spirit. Anybody remember that? Praise God, that's very often used. Or the spiritual sword. Why is the Word of God likened to a sword, an instrument of death? Because the carnal nature of the one <clears throat> who is alienated from God is put to death by it. The carnal nature of the one who is alienated from God is put to death by this flaming sword, this instrument of death. That carnal man cannot enter Eden, the paradise of God, but the man renewed by the word, transformed by the sword, can little by little enter into that place. Am I getting too far out for you here now? <clears throat> Praise God. We can enter into the place <clears throat> that Adam dwelt in. When we get to heaven, no, I'm talking about right here on in the nasty now and now, here in this earth. Now, 1 Corinthians 15, 50 says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither does corruption inherit incorruption. So flesh and blood, or the fleshly nature, cannot inherit the kingdom of God, but the new creation man can. And guess what? We're already the new creation man. We're already recreating in Christ Jesus. Though we're still living in an earthly body. So that new creation man, he's able to eat of the tree of life. And we're going to find out as we look. I'm just going to throw it out here now. This is the tree of life right here. This is a tree whose fruit gives life to our spirit man. We're going to look at that more. I'm throwing it out there now just to let you have that before I get to it. <clears throat> Now we're going to look at the book of Revelation a little bit here. This is going to really be great. Praise God. Now, I am not an expert on the book of Revelation. Any experts on the book of Revelation here? Okay, good. Whew, thank goodness. <clears throat> I feel safe in sharing this. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but I have read it. Anybody here read the book of Revelation? Okay, well, praise God. And then you said, okay, I think I'm going to look at something else. You know, Revelation, the book of Revelation is often interpreted as things that will happen at the end of the world or when we get to heaven, we'll see these things. But you know, as you study and think about it, many of the things that we see in Revelation appear to be things that have already taken place. For example, <clears throat> Revelation 2 verse 7 says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of what? The tree of life. Which is where? In the midst of the Eden of God. In the midst of the paradise of God. He that overcomes what? Well, the word overcome, if you look, look it up here, it means to be victorious. He that overcomes what? The spiritual entrapments of this present age, this present world. 
And we do that through Christ. We escape those entrapments. We've been made free from the power and authority of darkness and been translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son. See, that's been happening ever since Jesus died and was raised from the dead. People have been overcoming by the blood of the Lamb. He says in uh, <clears throat> Revelation 12, 11, They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Who is he talking about? He's talking about everyone who has received the salvation by the blood of Christ. They overcame by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of his testimony. Well, hasn't that already happened in, in our lives? I mean, well, is that going to happen when we get to heaven? We're going to overcome by the blood of the Lamb? No, we've already done that. Praise God. And by the word of their testimony. Now, that's been going on ever since Christ was raised from the dead. Every believer has overcome by the blood of the Lamb. Now, go to Revelation chapter 21. And we'll look at verse 1. Revelation 21. Okay, I hope I'm not drowning you today. I'm sorry if I am. Praise God. You'll get over it. You'll wake up at 3 in the morning. I get it. Praise God. Hallelujah. Okay. It says in Revelation 22, 1, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and the throne of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, on either side of, of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manners of fruit, and yielded every fruit, her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Hasn't God already given us something for the healing of the nations? Praise God. Amen. He's already given us what? The gospel. The gospel. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That was and is the thing that God has given us for the healing of the nations. Well, now we see it in here in Revelation as the leaves on something called the tree of life. And I was thinking about that this morning. You know, the gospel shows up in this book. The tree of life. It says leaves. I'm pointing out that this has already taken place. That's what I'm saying. These things in Revelation. He's already given us that which will heal the nations. And that's the gospel. And those who believe on Christ have already been delivered from the curse. Oh, wait a second. I didn't read this scripture. Verse, 20, verse 3. There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him. Those who believe on Christ have already been delivered from the curse that came upon Adam when he sinned. Why? Because we've been delivered of our sins. We've been forgiven. Fellowship with God has been restored. That is already a kingdom reality. And also the curse of the law. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it's written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. So we were delivered from the curse of the law when Christ hung at Calvary. When he rose from the dead, when we believed upon him. That is already a kingdom reality. See, we're looking at a heavenly picture in this book of Revelation, but a lot of it depicts things that have already taken place, that are already going on. You follow why I'm saying that? In other words, we don't wait to get to heaven to experience all that. We have the ability to experience it right now. If we understand, if we spiritually discern what's being said. <clears throat> okay, so we've been delivered from the curse. There shall be no more curse. Verse 24, and they shall see his face. And his name shall be in their foreheads. All right, here we go. Put on your spiritual cap. <laughs> his name shall be in their foreheads. <clears throat> what does that mean? To me, it's referring to the renewing of the mind. That's what the forehead is talking about. His name is indeed in our forehead. His mark is upon the way we think. Do we think different than the way the world thinks? That's because he's branded us in our forehead. 
our thinking. Our minds are renewed and forever transformed by the Word of God. That's how we're transformed. We don't think the way unsaved people think. The revealed word that we've received has branded our thinking forever. Is anybody here planning on going back and thinking the old way? I don't think so. I don't think so. Nobody's going to, I'll never go back again da, 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 to my old life. No, you're not going to do that <clears throat> because you, your thinking has been branded forever by the word of God. This is a present reality. God has marked us in our forehead. He's done that already. Not something that suddenly happens when we get to heaven. <clears throat> verse, 20, verse 5 of chapter 22. And there shall be no night there. <clears throat> All right. And they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God gives them light. And they shall reign forever and ever. What is the light of God, the light of the kingdom? It's the light that's in his word. <clears throat> now, I know this is just a book, paper with ink on it, you know, and words. But it, it takes us to the spiritual word. This is the, the word, but yet, if we read it and ponder it, it takes us to another dimension of the word, which is the spiritual word, the living word. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself, I think. So... What is the light of heaven? It's the light that's in his word. The light revealed to us as we ponder and feed upon the word. That's the light that we're supposed to live by. What is that light in reality? It's the light of Jesus, the living word. John 1, I've quoted it quite often, usually do. John 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Always has been. <clears throat> All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that would made, was made. We're talking about Jesus, the Word. In him was life, and the life was the light of man, the light of men. And we know verse 14 says, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We know that's talking about Christ. <clears throat> One rendering of that scripture about in him was life, and the life was the light of men. I've said this many times before. One rendering is... In him was life, and the life was the light that enlightens the hearts of men. It's the light that's in this word that enlightens men's hearts. That's the light of heaven. That's the light that we walk in. See, the light of that heavenly place that we see in Revelation 22 is the light of the Lamb, the living word, which is the light we receive from God. It's not a natural light. It's a heavenly light or a spiritual light. And once we receive it, we then conduct our lives accordingly. Or that is, we walk in the light of it. How many are trying to walk in the light of the Word? That's the light we're walking in. That's the light of heaven that we live in. Am I spiritualizing or spiritually discerning? Don't answer that. Praise God. <clears throat> In him was life and the light. Okay, Jesus said uh, in ver cha John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus said, Then spake Jesus unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. That's the revealed word of God, the revelation of the truth that the Spirit of God gives us. And we walk in that light in a different way than the world walks. See, we already have the light of heaven to live by. <clears throat> we already have access to the light that, give, that lights heaven. Will we have more of it when we get to heaven? Probably. Probably have a whole lot more. It says that we, we will know him even as we are known. Now we see in part. We see as through a mirror darkly or a glass darkly. But then shall we know him face to face and so on. But yeah, we'll have more light in heaven. <clears throat> But we can have as much of it right now as we want. Okay, praise God. We can have as much of that light right now as we want. Um, I heard Rick Joyner say this years ago, one of the few things. I remember a few things I heard him say, and this was one of them that stuck with me. He said, every believer is as close to God as they want to be. Hmm. Talk about the sword of the Spirit. <laughs> 
Every believer is as close to God as they want to be. In other words, if you want to get closer, spend some more time with Him. Spend some more time in His Word. We can have as much of God as we want right now, or as little. You see, we are already citizens of the kingdom of heaven, that heavenly place that we read about in Revelation. We are already, we already live in the light of it, or at least to the extent of the light we have, and we can get more light. If you hadn't noticed, I'm trying to stir people up to get in this word. If you're wondering, where is he going with this? I'm trying to stir folks up to get in this word and get some of that heavenly light. Like Samantha was sharing last, she got some revelation from the word, and it was good. It fed. <clears throat> and Paul says, we are children of light. That's one of his scriptures. And so what am I saying here? We're talking about the flaming sword that guards the way to the paradise of God. It's a flaming sword that transforms or changes people. It's the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit. Hebrews 4.12, we're all familiar with it. For the Word is, of God is quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and to the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, or the motives of the heart. So it says the word of God is quick. That is, it's a living thing. It's powerful. It's full of power. And it's sharper than any two-edged sword. The word of God is a sword that transforms. But it can only transform you if you get close to it. If you take some of it into your spirit. And when we know how to spiritually discern and receive the things of the spirit of God through his word then we can enter into that place where God is our Father and our Provider as it was with Adam in the garden. Praise God. This is so connected to our provision in this world. When Adam was in fellowship with God, everything worked good. We were talking about it. He had dominion over the earth. Have dominion over it. Subdue it, God told him. Multiply. You know, and all of that stopped when he lost fellowship. But we have that fellowship now. And we can make the connection to the Word and things will begin operating differently in your life because that kingdom begins to operate in your life. The, the tree of life is the Word of God. It's a tree whose fruit imparts life. Yeah, it's the only place you can get it is right here. You, you know, you can read all the books in the world and, of course, some people do write books about the revelation they have from the kingdom. They do share the, what God's given them and you can learn from that and grow from it and feed on it but this is the source right here. This is the only place you can get it, really. Sharper than any two-edged sword, separating between soul and spirit, and discerning the thoughts and the motives of the heart. It works on your heart. It does something in your spirit. <clears throat> the way of the tree of life has been opened to us in Christ. That's one of the things I'm, I'm bringing about here. The, the way to the tree of life, those who overcome, they shall eat of the tree of life, which is where? In the midst of the paradise of God. The flaming sword that guards the way has transformed us into new creatures in Him. And as new creatures, we can eat of that tree. We're already citizens of that heavenly place described in Revelation. Yes, we're living on the earth, but we're spiritual creatures living in the light of heaven. That's not too far out, is it? It's not too far out, praise God. We have the tree of life to feed upon. We have a tree whose fruit imparts life as we eat it. It's called the Word of God. It's alive and it's full of power. And it also purifies us. It discerns the thoughts and intents of our heart. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall what? See God. They shall see God. Revelation says in verse 20, chapter 22, 4, They shall see his face and his name shall be in their foreheads. Who is he talking about? Those who spend time pursuing him in his word. As we said before, every time I shared this before, I don't know, I think people caught it, but every time the Spirit of God reveals something to us from the word, we are getting a glimpse of Jesus, a glimpse of God himself, the living word. 
That's why the, the disciples on the road to Emmaus said, didn't our hearts burn when he opened the scriptures to us? Yeah, there's something that came alive on the inside. Yeah, this is good. This is good. Let's eat some of this. The Bible looks like other books, but unlike other books, the message conveys something out, not of this world. This is the only place you'll get a, a message that's not of this world. But from heaven. It's the only book out there that will connect us to a river of pure water of life flowing from the throne of God and a tree of life that we can eat from where we receive heavenly light to live by. Do you see that we already have access to that place Revelation is talking about? Praise God. Three o'clock in the morning, I promise you're going to get it. Hallelujah. Anyway, 1 Corinthians. See, we should all be getting revelation from the Word, um, which will bless and edify the body of Christ. Look at the scripture in 1 Corinthians 14, 26. Paul says this, How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you has a psalm? You know, some folks get songs. Has a doctrine? Some people get teachings. Has a tongue? Has a revelation? Has an interpretation? Let all things be done unto edifying. He was talking about a situation where we all come together and everybody's got something from the Lord. Praise God, the Lord showed me this. You got to hear it. Praise God. I got a song. The Lord gave me a song. Hallelujah. The Lord gave me a teaching. Praise God. It's so good. That's what we, that, see, that's the way the body of Christ is supposed, all of us are supposed to be receiving something from God. Not just the, the pastors and preachers and teachers and all those. So I just want to encourage, as we close here, I want to encourage all of us to get hungry for the Word of God and begin to feed upon it day by day. Let's eat of the tree of life that's been made available to us and grow up in the things of heaven. Amen? Amen. So, well, brother, that sounds great, but how do I do it? Hallelujah. Well, that's very simple. If you want this. I mean, if this is something you say, I think I'd like to have that. How do we do it? We do it by the leading of the Spirit. We're spiritually discerning because the Spirit of God leads us. Well, brother, I don't know where to start in the Bible. I don't know anything about the Bible. I don't know where to jump in there and start meditating and doing that. Well, you know, sometimes I ask the Lord to give me an entrance into His Word. I don't know. I know I need to be feeding on God's Word. I know I'm missing something when I'm not. And I say, Lord, there's so much there. What would you want me to, to study and meditate in? And I just ask a prayer, you know. I just say, Lord, would you give me entrance into your word? And uh, I believe the Holy Spirit will answer that prayer, you know, and lead us into our own personal place. Every, every one of us are at different places in the Lord. And we need to hear different things. And we have a personal place of study and meditation. But it's something we ought to be going after. So I want to pray, pray for that today as we close. And... Uh, you know, if anybody wants that, just stand up. We're going to pray. If anybody wants to know how to get into the Word, how to follow these things, how to get the light of heaven, then um, you're standing up as an act of saying, God, I want this. This is a prayer to God saying, Lord, I want this. So, Father, right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, we ask that you would give us an entrance into your Word. Each heart here, Lord, that you would reveal to us by your Spirit the area of Scripture you would have us to begin to study and to meditate in. Lord, we thank you, all they who are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God, and we are the sons and daughters of God. And we ask you to lead us into the study of your Word. We ask you to quicken it to us, Lord, to just bring it to our hearts and our minds what area to begin to study in the Scriptures. In the name of Jesus, we just ask you to do that, Father. Holy Spirit, we ask you to reveal it to each heart as we go our way today. And we thank you for it in the name of Jesus. Amen.